All right. Well, happy. I'm not sure. It's probably going to be Tuesday when I decide to stream this, <laughs> but this is another episode of Learning Tech Talks where we're exploring the landscape of learning and workplace technology. And the and workplace technology is a really important caveat for today's conversation because we're going to be talking about all sorts of stuff related to meetings, hybrid work. I, I, I don't even want to spoil where we go because then I'm going to say we're going to go this direction and we might go in a completely <laughs> different direction. So who knows? But I'm joined by Darren Chait, and I'm going to remember that forever because you're Aussie and you said it rhymes with mate. So I, I guess it. I'm going to have to kind of go with it. But you're not in Australia today, right? No, I'm in San Francisco, California right now. Okay. All right. And if I remember correctly, you, you, you split your time. You're like two thirds in Australia, one third in San Fran, right? Yeah. Something like that. That's right. All Although right. it depends right. when you ask a year ago, very different mix, but today that's sort of what I'm doing. Very different mix. So I'm curious, what was the spread 12 months ago or two years ago? Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny how I ended up back in Australia. I'm originally Australian, obviously. I lived in San Francisco for about five years. Okay. And in March 2020, I, we were on our way to a, a big SaaS conference called SaaStop, um, you may be familiar okay. with. And it got cancelled <laughs> right at the last second. Um, and I said to my wife, I'm like, oh, I'm not going uh, to SaaS anymore. Why don't we just go to Sydney and visit family? Like things are a little crazy right now. Everyone's kind of gone home because of this little flu that it might be with us for a few weeks <laughs> or whatever it was. Let's let's yeah. use the opportunity. Let's head back to Sydney. I can work from Sydney. Um, anyway, fast forward two years and we we never left. We got stuck there for a while. Okay. There was some pretty crazy border restrictions out of Australia. Um, you literally couldn't leave. And I got set up working remotely and it worked really well. Um, we can talk more about that. Uh, and we decided that would be our home base. It was the right opportunity okay. to move back to Sydney. We had one one, one child, another on the way. And we like, let's, let's do this. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's so it was a hundred zero. Now that things are opened up a bit, it is really nice being able to hop on a plane and, and get over here or, or anywhere for that matter um, okay. from time to time. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Your story's not necessarily completely unique, but you do run into stories like that where people, they got stuck somewhere and all of a sudden they went, huh, well, I guess we're here why not be here more permanently <laughs> exactly <laughs> thing. exactly it's funny yeah. because we i mean i don't want to don't want to run away with the conversation too fast but we i we always thought like we, we were obviously being a startup and in the bay area yeah. and you know the the, the, the typical software uh, software startup we, we were always fans of remote we had half the team remote yeah. even for the team that were in san francisco we did a few days at home a few days in the office we, we knew how that worked. That motion was second nature for us. But working in a completely different time zone at the other end of the world just felt so unachievable. Then yeah. we're forced to do it for, a, for some time. And we realized, actually, yeah. there's some real benefits. Uh, asynchronous yeah. collaboration and working different hours and waking up a little early to be able to spend time with the team. But then having my evenings back and spending time with the family and all of these benefits yeah. started to, to pop up. And we realized that actually it's probably the perfect setup. Um, so well, you know what, Wait, this is, yeah. it's no way. This isn't that much of a sidetrack because really we're going to tie this together because the reality is this is the face of work anymore. I mean, I think the lines that we've historically drawn around, well, it has to be like this, or we need it to go like this, or this is just what we've got to put up with, whether it's meetings, whether it's learning, whether it's a lot of things, they all got just thrown out the window two years ago. And I think that's forced a lot of people to jump into things that they thought, well, we can't really do that. And now they're finding out, well, maybe we can. So, but, but, but again, we're going to dive into this fairly deep, but before we do, I am curious, this, this does tie to the background of, of your location. What is kind of your founder story with this? Because for those who don't know, and we'll, we'll explain it in more length after hearing this piece, Hugo's a meeting. I don't know what, 30 seconds, how do you describe it? I was hoping you'd, I was waiting for that. Um, we're a meeting product hub for teams. So we connect, uh, yeah. we connect teams together around their meeting workflows, um, providing them one place for their calendar, meeting preparation and note-taking. And we integrate that yeah. with the rest of your tools. So 
uh, as you take notes in your as we take notes in Hugo or prepare for your meeting in Hugo, we'll we'll organize it by the contacts and companies you've met. We'll push out the actions to your CRM, your project management tools. We'll share the insights with the team via Slack, Microsoft Teams, email, and so on, and give the whole team one central repository for everyone's meeting knowledge. Okay, because the when when I think about it, when people ask me about Hugo, when they're like, "What what is it?" I'm like, "I the best way I can describe it, it makes meetings better." Like, just think of the things you don't like about meetings. It makes them, those things better. Like, I know that's a very, and then then it's always like, well, what do you mean? And then I have to go into more details. But anyway, so before we get into that, though, how did you end up deciding I'm going to be the co-founder of a meeting productivity platform type of a thing? Like, was that a yeah. childhood dream of yours? Or, I mean, how did that end up coming to fruition? You were in the Bay Area, so I'm guessing the, right. the tech thing was part of it. Definitely, maybe a childhood nightmare. Um, meetings <laughs> for me. I, let's let's rewind a bit. I yeah. So grew up in Sydney, Australia. Um, I went to law school and I was working for a big corporate law firm uh, for about four years after after school. And uh, the thing about lawyers. Uh, so firstly, um, as you know, most <laughs> lawyers bill bill for their time, right? They charge you based on how many minutes they spend uh, working on something for you. I'm fully so, waiting on the invoice for this conversation. So yeah, I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> well, I better speak fast then. Um, so <laughs> the, th the thing is, right, that you end up um, with meetings and the pain around meetings, which is, by the way, very common in almost any workplace. For lawyers particularly, it's, a partic it's, it's even worse because there's a direct cost. Um, on those meetings so you know when i walk out of a, a waste of time meeting in a you know a normal business it's a waste of time it's frustrating but there's no direct cost yes my time divided by you know what yeah. i earn and this and that but i'm not paying money for that meeting lawyers you actually charge someone and and the numbers are right <laughs> in front of you and i remember walking out of these meetings where they would have like five or six of us in there and a couple of clients and you'd go back to your billing software on your, on your computer and you'd see that, man, that meeting just cost like three and a half thousand dollars and nothing happened. We just <laughs> spoke about stuff and wrote down a few notes and, and literally nothing happened. So you had a very, very direct P&L look at this is what a meeting yeah. is actually costing. That's right. That's right. And it blew my mind. I like, especially when you think about, you know, what you earn in the early days as a junior lawyer for the hours you work and it's not that great for the hours you're working. And then you're like, man, like my weekly salary was just that one hour meeting that did nothing. Like it's so frustrating. Um, and I've always been a bit of an efficiency nerd. So a really close friend of mine, Josh, um, he's also Aussie, but he was already in the Bay Area working in products okay. for a big retail tech company. And we would always just complain to each other. You know, at the end of the week, he'd be like, man, my week, listen to this. And then he'd be like, no, no, you listen to this. Um, in product, we've all, we've had so many of these meetings and they've gone nowhere or we've had these amazing meetings and then we come back the next time and this first half of the meeting is just trying to recount what happened last time because everyone scribbled things down. They went nowhere, no actions happened. Uh, half the people were in the room that didn't need to be there. Half the people that needed to be there weren't in the room and meetings were just this huge pain for him already working in tech. So yeah we decided we wanted to do something about it. It made so much sense. And, and already there was a lot of change coming about in the workplace. Like this is, you know, 2016. So pre pandemic, um, remote was already a trend. Um, we were seeing a lot of like decentralization and flattening of, of structures. We were seeing, um, a million tools already. So it's product, you know, project management collaboration tools, Slack was, was growing and so on. Um, so things were so different in the way we were, but meetings hadn't changed in generations. It was still oh, the hadn't. case that you had to be in the room. If you weren't there, you had no idea what happened. You had this great discussion. Everyone scribbled down notes that go nowhere. There's no follow-up. There's no stored anywhere. You leave the company and all of this knowledge just dis disappears. And all of these pains were still there. So we said, we've got to, we've got to sort this out. Got to solve it. You, gotta solve. you know, it's funny as you, as you talk through all of that, that, I mean, again, I, the point you make about the lawyer and the amount of money that's wasted on meetings actually is one that it almost seems like a lot of companies have accepted is just the cost of doing business, which to me is unfortunate because it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, we, a lot of times it's like, well, that's what you do. You just have meetings that are giant waste of time with, you know, 10 six figure salaries all sitting around talking for no reason type of a thing. And you're like, okay, there's a better way to do it. So 
How has that journey progressed though? Because if you got started on that, what, what you, 2016 was when kind of the journey began? Like where did that yeah. start and how has that evolved? Because saying, man, meetings are awful and inefficient and we should do something about that. That could feel like, I don't know, trying to solve world hunger or you know, global, <laughs> global climate change where you go, oh yeah, okay. I mean, where did that start and where how has that evolved? Yeah. So interesting. So we actually started, we thought the key to very effective meetings was in preparation. So okay. we started out by building a mobile app that was focused on meeting preparation. We wanted to give you all the context you needed to crush that next meeting. And uh, a lot of lessons there. We, we moved to, we moved, well, I moved to San Francisco. Josh was already there. He left his job and we started building together. At the time, we thought that uh, being in the Bay Area, at least in the US, but in the Bay Area would give us a real advantage um, compared to working from Australia as far as investors, yeah. markets, customers, time zones and that. Um, and it probably did then, to be fair. I think the world might be a bit different now, but yeah. in 2016, <laughs> I, I, I am very happy we did that. Um, and we built this mobile app, uh, raised a bit of money, built this mobile app, and we ended up in a really strange spot. So we had all this excitement and engagement around our product. But we're okay. in this danger zone where we were helping you at work, but there was no enterprise value. So you had this mobile app that was going to make you, Christopher, a better L&D professional. You love it. But how much are you willing to pay yourself to be better at your job? But from the company's perspective, they don't see the value of this, right? Because it's got nothing yeah. to do with them. It's making you a better professional. So we ended up in this danger zone of like prosumer products where the consumer doesn't want to pay huh. because it's for the business, but the business doesn't want to pay because it's for the consumer. Um, Interesting. But anyway, as we were trying to navigate that, um, we it's kind of funny if a couple of things happened at the same time. One, um, my co-founder and I spent a lot of time out of the office. We were meeting customers, investors, partners, trying to navigate advisors, trying to navigate our way through this. And the team, which at the time was a handful of you know, engineers, designers, the marketer were in the office and, they were disconnected from what we were hearing. We'd come back at the end okay. of the day and say, hey, everyone, here's what we learned today. Um, you know, like, oh, we really should push in this direction. I don't think that's going to work. And they'd be like, okay. And everyone would kind of try and capture them. We'd disappear again. <laughs> and we'd come back two days later and just brain dump everything we'd learned. And it really caused this disconnect because we were on the front line hearing this stuff. The team was sort of trying to act on it, but they didn't have access to it. They weren't plugged in to, to what was happening out there. So someone on the team, and it was actually, I think it was based on the customer's idea, if I recall correctly, but they had an idea to build a Slack bot that connected to our calendar. We built it okay. in, the, in the existing app just because we had the infrastructure. But what it would yeah. do, it would ping me and say, hey, Darren, you just met with Christopher, what happened? And I'd reply to this Slack bot and it would share it with the rest of the team. So the note, my really? notes for the meeting would be shared via Slack with everyone else. So all of a sudden there was this transformation like we were taking the whole team to every meeting uh, because they had without this, this without the kindergarten soccer team. Exactly. Exactly. They had access to like everything that was happening on the front line. We had it stored in an effective way. And then, you know, engineering was saying all these great ideas. We really need them in Trello and, you know, sales as we started to build them were saying, we need this stuff in our CRM if you're talking to a customer. So we started building a few integrations as well on top of that. Um, and before we know it, knew it that was the beginning of hugo um the customers that saw the way we were working as a team were more excited about that process than the product as it was so we pivoted i hate that word uh to build a web app um <laughs> now, now hugo and uh that's uh, that that was the beginning of beginning of hugo and that we yeah we took that to market in late 2018 and that's okay. that's that's been hugo ever since you know what's really interesting about that story and i think you know, this is anybody, anybody listening and watching this can take this away from it is the fact that when I think about people complaining about meetings, like you, you know, initially went down this path and discovered and, and we'll use your favorite word pivoted on was the fact that everybody's solution usually is, you know, what we really should get better at meeting agendas. Like we should send agendas and pre-reads out because if we do that, we will have better meetings, which not, not saying that's not important and that that might not help meetings be more effective, but what you got there from a, what you hit on there from a behavior standpoint that I think a lot of times gets missed is that's not necessarily the biggest problems that 
result from poor meeting behavior. It's, it's that whole, you know, I mean, I just even think about it where people go, I don't want to miss this meeting because I kind of need to know what happened, but I don't really have time to be in the meeting, you know, and then that results in people being there, but they're not really there because they don't belong there. And this whole sense of like, well, now there's 37 people on an invite where only three people really need to be part of the discussion, but 37 people legitimately probably need to know or may have some thoughts or feedback on things type of a thing. Like that's really where meetings fall apart. 100%. I think that's it. I, the other way of thinking about it is, you know, when we're trying to build software that changes behavior, we want to start yeah. with the path of least resistance. You're already taking notes. Most people take notes in meetings. They go nowhere, they get lost, <laughs> they're not actionable, like all of those things, but you're taking notes already. So it's not a big ask to say, hey, instead of scribbling that on paper or putting in your own Evernote account, put in Hugo. Because as soon as you do that, we can add all this additional value with no extra effort. Okay. Um, and that's like the gateway. We do see more than half of um, all meetings in Hugo have preparation, have an agenda now. And that is a behavior okay. that we push very heavily um, because it is best practice. If you prepare for your meeting, everyone gets there engaged, no information sharing, and meetings turn into debate, discussion, decision making, all the good stuff. Uh, but it, it's a much bigger ask to say, hey, I want you now to start preparing for every meeting where, uh, where you're not doing that right now. Um, you know, so the behavioral change and habit formation um, particularly with software has been has been been really eye opening, and I think that's why we we were successful with adoption, focusing first on the meeting note, and then moving into you know changing habits around preparation. Okay, what's it, what's interesting about that is kind of two things that stand out. Is one on the so I'm I'm one of the weird ones. I never take meeting notes like ever. I never have, and it was always just because of the. I'm kind of an efficiency geek. So for me, if I go, okay, I'm not going to do anything with this anyway, that I'm not going to waste my time doing it. So I never took notes because I'm like, all I'm going to do is set it somewhere, forget about it or throw it away in a week. It's it's adding no value to anything. So I'm just going to dump it type of a thing. And I think again, but this goes to a problem in a lot of organizations, which is knowledge management. And there's a lot of knowledge shared. There's a lot of information shared, a lot of relationship pieces that happen in meetings that there is value knowing what's going on, what's shared, what's said in those things. And I think that's, it's an important point, but on the preparation piece, you know, I think the other thing that's interesting on the preparation piece, because again, I've used Hugo. So, you know, I'm very familiar with the product. But that agenda piece, I just think of the operational piece that usually creates it being a problem in most meeting environments, which is some poor sucker gets assigned the the prep, the, the pre-meeting person. And their job is to yeah. like run around to everybody and get agenda items and nobody responds to them. And they're like, can you send the pre-reads? Can you? And nobody does anything. And then everybody just shows up at the meeting. Because when you think about what needs to be prepared for a meeting, a lot of times it's, I mean, I think about how I prepare for meetings. I'll come out of a different meeting and go, you know what, when I talk to so-and-so on Thursday, I need to make sure I bring this up. And rather than jotting it on a post-it note or throwing it somewhere and then forgetting or whatever, I can actually put it somewhere and you can collaboratively build that. What does this meeting need to be about? And exactly. comment, collaborate, things like that. And that's a lot of times missing when, poor so-and-so who's like, oh, great, I'm responsible for planning the agendas. Like, well, I'm on my own and I'm going to have to try and guess what the meeting's about. Yeah, yeah. And what you're describing, I think, is one of the biggest trends in collaboration that we've seen over the last two years, which is asynchronous okay. collaboration. Um, the yeah. idea that I can, we can all prepare. Like, we used to see this funny phenomenon um, around the pre-meeting meeting, particularly when it's external <laughs> with a customer. So oh, like, the pre-meeting hey, meetings. Like, you know, hey, hey, team, um, before we go and meet this big customer, we need to get together and, and figure out our story. Uh, what do we want to cover? What are the objectives? Um, what's And you have a meeting about your meeting. Um, and that I really think we've done a good job at, at crushing because it's – it, the reason you've done that is because we didn't collaborate asynchronously. There was no right. effective way or process to say exactly what you described. Like, what does everyone want to throw in the agenda here? What are we all going to talk about? Is everyone happy? Edit it as, as you see fit. Go to this meeting prepared, but we've never actually sat down to talk about this meeting before. Right. Um, so async, um, and that's just one example of asynchronous collaboration, but 
you know, that's probably one of the best things to come out of the pandemic at work in my view. Okay. Interesting. Well, I'm also curious, you know, you get a, you probably see a ton of data cause you're seeing how people are doing meetings. Are there any other things? So, so the collaboration ahead, and I think this, again, this was a struggle for a lot of folks when the pandemic hit, because it was, at least when folks were in person, it was a little more, you were bumping into each other, you'd have these conversations. So at least you came into a meeting a little more prepared to have a conversation. All of a sudden, everybody was all over the place. And then it was people showed up at these meetings, you know, on Zoom, they're already half distracted with the other 10 things going on. And then it was like, what are we here for type of a thing? Are there any other patterns of behavior that you've seen that were one way before, but now you're starting to see changes? Well, what you described was really interesting. So when the pandemic hit early 2020, we had a moment of like, oh, like we could be in trouble here, right? Like what's going <laughs> to happen to meetings? Because if you think about it, like what, okay, now everyone's working remotely from home. So in-person meetings are over, um, you know, business and the economy and all of that was really in question or, you know, up in the air for a bit. Yeah. So sales pipelines were drying up. Um, people weren't hiring. So, uh, so recruiting was, uh, was, was, you know, really drying up. So we're like, all of these meetings just aren't going to exist. Like, what's the use case for Hugo with no meetings? Um, <laughs> and we were sort of sitting there with the dashboards, like, you know, going, oh my God, what's going to go on? And the opposite happened. Meeting numbers really? just exploded. Yeah. Um, and it, we couldn't believe it. I wrote a piece for Quora, I think it was like April or May 2020, where I shared some of the data and I said, uh, and we're talking about that. And when we looked at the, some of the meeting titles and tried to, you know, anonymize and, 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 and analyze the data, we just saw titles like catch up, sync, update, like all of this stuff just went through the roof because what people were doing was what you described, that that water cooler conversation, that quick like, hey, Christopher, check this out. Or like, um, do you have a minute? I was just thinking now turn into 30 minutes on your calendar. And that was where the Zoom fatigue, you know, term was coined. And that that first year of the pandemic where we were all like, like pulling our hair out. Um, some more than others, maybe, but um, we were like, <laughs> I didn't have any to start, so it's fine. <laughs> this is not pandemic's problem. Um, yeah, we were we were really just um, struggling with this because we just the number of meetings exploded. Every human interaction was now thirty minutes on my calendar, and uh, that that drove, I think, a lot of really positive uh, progress in the way we collaborate. The move towards async, um, you know, realizing that meetings aren't the answer. Um, and looking to other tools and processes and, and, and systems and ways of, of operating and collaborating um, was sort of like the phase two of the pandemic. Now, I think that problem still exists. I read the other day some Microsoft research from, you know, through 2021 that said there's 200 times more meetings um, yeah, the than there meetings were pre-pandemic. It, it, it's wild. So we definitely haven't hit our stride there as a you know society or a workforce, but it's, uh, I think we're starting to now realize and a lot of talk about async, which we'll keep coming back to, um, has, uh, has, has helped there for sure. Well, and I'm curious on this one, you know, from a user behavior, because I think one of the challenges and this Zoom fatigue thing is it's, it's kind of, I, I made a post on LinkedIn the other day about the fact that, you know, people don't have survey fatigue. They're just tired of being asked about things and then nobody doing anything. And I feel like Zoom fatigue is a similar thing. People aren't necessarily fatigued from Zoom. They're fatigued from being in these back-to-back -back things that are yeah. not adding any value to them. Worth it. And they get to the yeah. end of the day and go, I was in all these freaking things and I got nothing done nothing. and it was a yeah. giant waste of my time. And yeah. I think that's where it's like, okay, to your point, we haven't really hit this stride because I think the FOMO, the fear of missing out thing, still happens a lot where, like you said, people are packing their calendars all day and not necessarily going, you know what though? The notes is okay. <laughs> I don't have to go show up if I'm really not part yeah. of this discussion, but I just need to know what goes on there. How are, how are people adjusting to that? I mean, are you seeing people starting to get on that? Cause I do sometimes, yeah. I mean, I have conversations where I'm like, just don't go to the meeting and people look at you like, are you, you crazy? Mean, don't attend. You're like, uh, you literally said you're just going to kind of figure out like, what's the general discussion happening on here. It doesn't sound like you need to be part of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so, so that's an interesting metric that we monitor with Hugo. Um, the meet, like the meeting efficiency, with like the number of attendees, we see in general a forty percent reduction in, in meeting attendance over time, um, but really? up to six months or so. Um, so, yeah, yes is the answer. Um, I, I think the problem is though, um, you know, Hugo aside, and obviously there's other solutions and workarounds there too. <laughs> um, if you're not sharing notes, if you don't have a habit of sharing notes, you are going to miss out. Like that's where yeah. that's that. You know, that, that's where knowledge is shared. Like meetings are where work gets managed. It's where we share information. Even at a personal level, it's it's where you establish shared consciousness and you know, like, the types of people and how they think and, and what's going on for them. So the, the FOMO is right. Um, unless you have good processes for capturing what happens in a meeting and sharing it and having it accessible and um, serviceable, you, you're going to miss out if you're not in a meeting. So, I'm I, like, I don't blame everyone. Um, I that's blame... Fair the leaders and those that have the opportunity to, to, to create that culture of sharing meeting knowledge. So you don't need to be there. Like a really good, we talk about the three D's, like the, the okay. real meeting is for debate, discussion and decision-making. Now, if you're not going to be a part of those things, you shouldn't be there. If it's for knowledge sharing, yeah. for updates, for just understanding what's happening, read the notes. Or if you really have to, listen to a recording, if you really have to. Um, if you're coaching or <laughs> I like the face but, you made yeah. with that because I can't tell you how many times I've seen people be like, let's record this meeting. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, so no Not one can ever watch it? I mean, okay, sure. <laughs> the only benefit of recordings I personally think is for like sales coaching and, and like the customer True. facing needs. But anyway. That's fair. Um, yeah, but anyway, so that's that's it. I, I think I, I don't blame that feeling of foam. Blame the businesses who should have a culture where meeting knowledge is shared, notes are shared. You've got access to what's happening, or you had the agenda before, and you can opt out and be like, "Hey, guys, this is the weekly L and D catch up, but there's actually nothing on here that I need. I've got the update because everyone's throwing their updates or the metrics or whatever we're sharing. The discussion doesn't involve me, so I'm going to sit this one out. Um, I'm not going to have foam. I know what you're talking about, um, and I've just got that hour back in my life. So. That's the that's the failure point, not the individuals who have the FOMO. Well, and and so on that, and, and maybe we can kind of shift gears to kind of talk about this a little bit. Is is some of this operational implications of it? Because I've I've seen just with, and this is just a philosophical thing when it comes to tech. A lot of times is a lot of times people are looking for the tech solution to solve the problem. Like, oh, if we get this app or we buy this platform magically all these things are going to fix themselves. And I can see people going, hey, great, we get Hugo, and then our meetings are going to be better. Mm, the capability for your meetings to be better is there, 100%. but without the operational implications, because, you know, I mean, I just think some of my meeting practices, and I'd love to just hear some of the things that you've seen as good starting points, because this can feel overwhelming. You go, oh, meetings are a mess. Like, how are we going to solve these things? But I just think even for myself and my teams where, I mean, sharing your updates ahead of time somewhere is, is hard. Like it's, it's an intentional shift in your behavior to go take 10 minutes or even just, again, if you're using a tool to do it well, when something pops up, just go put it in there. Don't wait and don't save things to share live. That is that takes some practice and repetition. It's like lifting a weight that yeah. is not always easy to do. That's right. The gym membership is not going to make me strong and fit, right? Um, I, you, may need, you, you, need, you need that, but you've got to have the intent to, you know, to, to, to get fit or lose weight or whatever your objective is. And uh, yeah, it's much the same. I, I think that's right. You can't outsource that because it's a cultural shift. We, we've also done a lot of research ourselves on the relationship between meeting best practice and team culture. So, you know, we ask okay. teams about their meeting practices, uh, you know, what proportion of meetings have an agenda. Do you share notes out? Um, you know, uh, do people attend meetings that don't need to be there or only need to be there for information purposes? That, And then we ask them other questions around their team culture, their quality of collaboration. They're obviously correlated. Oh, like it, it's no surprise, but the data's there. And, um, that all goes to say that you need to have the intent to like, you need to a, realize that meetings are the, the crux of collaboration at, at the very core. It's where your team spend most of their meetings and most of the time, sorry, it's at odds with, with meaningful work. A lot of the time um, it's one of the strongest pain points at work for, you know, for, for everyone. Um, and if you want to improve the way your team works together, you have to focus on meetings and focusing on meetings means adopting best practices. Um, 
we're going to make those best practices a lot easier by giving you, you know, a market leading app to support your team, but you can't outsource that. (laughs) It's, it's a shift. So, um, you know, and, and, and the, and the cool thing is you don't have to be a management nerd. Like, you know, we, we put out this guy called vital meetings and we spoke about good meetings have pants. Um, so a purpose and an agenda that's collaborative and shared, um, notes, tasks, and, and, and share and sharing at the end. So, um, it's all basic stuff, right? Like we all know this. There's nothing revolutionary. We're like, oh man, an agenda before the meeting. Wow, I would never thought of that. <laughs> I've never thought of that before. That. <laughs> That's right. We just don't. It's just. It's just. You know. We just don't do that. So that you need that commitment to uh, to the basics. But all you need to just do it a couple of times, you'll see the light. And as soon as you see these meetings that are halving in length and halving in attendees and uh, the way your team feel about you know, work and then the amount of work and out all of these things, it, it's like a drug, right? It's, it, it, it's addictive. You can't, you can't go back from that. Your team won't let you anyway, you know, and, and to be fair, one of our biggest, strongest growth levers at Hugo is, uh, is the sharing piece, you know, connect okay. Slack, start sharing your meeting notes to Slack. You can't ever take that away. Um, you know, you see other parts of the business that now have exposure to, to certain meetings, to what customers are saying, to big decisions that are being made that is an irreversible decision because your team gets so much value from it that they'll never let you take that away from them. So um, it's, it's definitely a commitment to changing process for sure um, to, to be able to pull this off supported by tools uh, for sure. So I'm curious on this one because this will be, this will be a good kind of let's, let's go what good looks like on this and kind of talk through this. And did you say paths? Like that's your acronym for remembering what it is like, like pants, like oh wearing, pants, yeah. like P A N T S. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Man. <laughs> yeah. So so soup to nuts start to be start to end. I am really curious, and then I want to talk about kind of this this how workflow happens with things because I think that also does make a difference. But when you've seen you know as you've seen folks kind of optimize meetings. Cause I think this goes back to kind of, okay, what does good look like on the other side? I think probably conceptually, a lot of people in their head could probably go, I, I think I get it, but what does that look like? I mean, obviously, like you said, and let's go ideal use case in an ideal use case. If you said, if every meeting could look like this, your life would be, we'll, we'll make up some percentage a thousand sure. times better than it is today. Yeah. <laughs> what would that look like? Yeah, yeah, good, good, good question. So um, the first is the purpose. Like, do we actually even need a meeting? And right. now, if you look through your calendar, you've got a ton of recurring meetings. You've got your check-ins, your catch-ups, your weeklies, your whatever you want to call them. Um, why are they all there? Like a lot of the time, they're there because we feel like we need to, you know, be across what's happening. We need to stay in sync. They're there because they've always been there. They're just ingrained in team processes. Um, what what is the actual purpose of this meeting? And if you start using, if you if you answer that for me and start using words like update, check in, sync, that for me, I've got like alarm bells going off in my head because that's they're really important processes of working in a team. But you don't need a meeting. We have Slack, wow. we have Notion, we have <laughs> we have a hundred trillion tools. Um, just share that information. Send a Loom video like. Hey, Christopher, I want to just update you on, you know, my L and D focus for the week, what I've been working on and the status of this project. Like, awesome. You got a much better update than you would have got in the meeting. You can watch it on your schedule. It's taken me five minutes to record that. Um, and you, you're like, man, this guy's great. I, uh, I've got everything I know from him and everything I need to know from him. And, and we're on the same page done meeting avoided. Um, so the real purpose of a meeting, I touched on it before, but the debate, discussion, decision-making, we do need to get together sometimes. Um, and it should be for a very specific purpose that involves that two-way um, dynamic, not for the updates. Now, sometimes, and these are the best meetings, I think, you can actually cover the updates and information sharing through preparation. So yeah. talking about agendas, right? So we do need a meeting. Um, so you now need a plan. You know what the purpose of the meeting is. What are we going to cover? And when you think about what we want to cover, there's some stuff that should just be for information sharing, throw in the agenda. So everyone's across, you know, the context, everyone should read this, everyone should see the latest metrics if that's relevant, you know, whatever, whatever the pre-reading is. Um, and then it needs to be collaborative. 
Now, collaborative agendas are game changing. Um, it sounds so obvious. And again, I'm you know not pushing Hugo too heavily. Use a Google Doc if you have to, for like for God's sake, because if you can go and you know start a anything's document, better than nothing. <laughs> That's right. Here are the things we're going to cover, and then share it with everyone in the meeting. Two things are going to happen. One. You've obviously you're going to miss some stuff, and everyone in the meeting can can add to it. But more importantly, everyone in the meeting, whether they added something or not, feels a part of that meeting. They arrive engaged because they've weighed in on what that meeting's about, what they're going to talk about. They know what to expect. They've turned their mind to it before. You're going to have an incredible meeting from the get go um, because everyone's a part of that meeting. It's not your meeting that everyone's attending who's going to sit. They're going to sit there and not know what any of it's about. Wish we could talk about some other stuff. Um, and having, you know, have been be put on the spot to think through everything. So collaborative agenda setting is, is absolutely it. And the other thing is obviously, as, as we would all know, the running of the meeting is that much better with an agenda. It's really easy to keep things on track and you've got a natural template to take notes too, just fill in the headings, um, you know, as, as you go. Um, note taking. So, so you've got your great meeting. You need to have it. Everyone's on board. You're more prepared collaboratively. The information that can be shared asynchronously is in the agenda. So we're not going to waste meeting time on it. Now we're having this amazing debate and discussion. We're making all these decisions in the meeting, capturing it. Like it's still costing a fortune. So why would you let the value dissipate when it ends? Like <laughs> hold on to that stuff. Like, so, yeah. so getting some notes down and I'm not talking about like transcribing every word but just like what we discussed and what the takeaways were remembering that this is this is gold for people who weren't in the room and this is also gold for you in six months time when you have no idea what we spoke about um or you know all that time ago so some some notes and again depending on the culture some sometimes you have one note taker other times everyone will add to the notes um collaboratively whatever works get the notes down um tasks and actions um there's some really good frameworks here Amazon are really good at this. Apple historically have some good cultures there, but we talk a lot about like directly responsible individuals. So not just figuring out what we need to do yeah. next, but who's going to own it. So much stuff slips through the cracks, right? You're like, yeah, things we should really get onto all this stuff. And we've all been in that meeting. I mean, us. I'm just thinking of the meeting where you get to the end and you're like, that was a really great discussion. And then the meeting ends yeah, and you're well, like, but does anybody know, is anybody doing anything about this type of a thing? And the meeting ends, you're like, uh, all right, well, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> exactly. And the Royal we, where it's like, yeah, we, we got this. Like we're going to do it. Yeah, we got like, this. Like, my response <laughs> like, yeah, you're doing it. Like, you know, et cetera. So yeah, actions, um, tasks, like literally this is what we need to be doing. Like Christopher's going to go and do this research and, and spec this out. Darren's going to go and, you know, talk to customers about X, Y, and Z. Um, it's very, very clear. Um, it allows us to circle back and make sure stuff gets done. Um, and then the sharing, and we spoke a lot about the sharing, but the, the, the sharing, I think, is twofold. You know, the importance of sharing, uh, like, to be honest, if I said two changes that you should make in your org, one would be the preparation, the agenda setting, and the other okay. would be the sharing. Because the sharing, one, lets people not attend meetings um, who don't need to be there for the debate discussion, you just need to be across what's happening. So huge efficiency for the, for the business. But it also achieves... Um, an element of shared consciousness and keeps the team on the same page and the big cultural impact there. You know, think about if you're a, in an engineering team, you're a software developer, you never talk to customers. You're just told to keep writing these lines of code because the product right. team said so and whatever. And all of a sudden you're now exposed to like customer meetings or, you know, you're a designer and you're, you're getting an early preview to what the product team's talking about in their roadmap meetings. These things are helping you make better decisions. You have the context of what you do, why you do. You're motivated to do what you do. Um, and the, 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 the cultural impact, the team impact of sharing more widely is, is really game changing. Um, so that is the last piece of a very effective meeting in my view. You know, what's, what's funny about it is like listening to, through some of these things, it can't, I mean, it, it honestly, if you've been in an org and I've been in a lot of different orgs that have all sort of meeting cultures, I think recognizing that your org has a meeting culture and kind of go, this is kind of how meetings are today. And some of the things you described, you're going to be swimming upstream a bit going, all right, like this is going to be a tough ship to turn but there are some that are like, well, but here's an easy way to, you know, get started with it. And I think, you know, for me, one of the things that, that comes to mind that's been helpful with stuff is being able to lead the charge on that. And like you said, look, if we can at least collaborate around what is the purpose of this meeting and can we get updates out of the meeting? Like I remember when I was changing things with one org where I just had to say, 
no updates shared. Like we're not going to share the updates. We might discuss them if we go, hey, I saw something like this. Is there anything we need yeah. to talk about with this? Or is there an implication of this on something else? That's fine. But if you come in and run through a task list of what you're doing, like I'm just going to shut you down and say, nope, put it in whatever tool, whether like you said, Google Docs, Hugo, wh whatever that is, put it there. We're not going to talk about it. Those are like some small steps that make it go, okay, well, well that that is reasonable. Then you can kind of start to cascade and go, well, what's what's the next meeting behavior You know, we can change? And it sounds like the sharing one... Um, I am curious with folks from a meeting behavior though, what do you see with that? Cause I can see that being really positive, but potentially also really overwhelming. Like it can be overwhelming to deal with just the meetings you're in to some degree, the thought of now I'm looking at like all the meetings of all the people that are out there type of a thing. How do you, how do you recommend or how have you seen people balance that? Cause I can see that being like information overload. Over sharing. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's two types of sharing. Um, you've got active sharing and passive sharing. Active sharing yeah. is me mentioning you and me pushing something to you saying, Hey, Crystal, you really need to see this. So we achieve that through assigning tasks yeah. or just mentions and emails. That is really where I'm, I'm disrupting your flow to go and check it out. Passive sharing is more, around making things available. Um, so, you know, you can flick through when you've got downtime as your interest dictates. So that's the most effective way to share those meetings. Um, we, we see a lot of our customers create lots of Slack channels where they can be like customer meetings and um, you know, weekly product okay. meetings and L&D team meetings and that. And you can just subscribe to whatever you like and you can see a feed of meetings and, you know, you can check them out as, as, as you want, but you don't have to. Um, and I think distinguished need to know versus what is nice to know um, from a meeting standpoint is a way to reduce that, reduce that, uh, you know, overwhelming feeling. But either way, the alternative, which is not knowing anything or attending a lot more meetings, which is more common, um, <laughs> takes up so much more time. So it's, it's usually not a it's complaint. True. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, and I, I like how you broke down though, the passive versus active. Cause I think sometimes there's a tendency and we, and I see this in learning and development a lot where, Things that maybe could be more passive where you say, listen, I mean, do we really need to force everybody clockwork orange through this stuff? Like, no, yeah. we don't. Let's let it be more passive type of a thing. It's available and accessible that people can find if they want to, but we're not going to shove it down people's throats versus the active piece of, um, and, and just one example. And again, I, I'm familiar with your product. So, you know, like one thing that comes to mind with this that is really helpful is there is that benefit to, and I think this is sometimes why people end up attending meetings they have no business attending is there's that like, well, what if somebody mentions something that I might need to be involved in yeah. type of a thing? So you end up sitting in a 60 minute meeting yeah. on the what if, the right? <laughs> yeah, like what if, and it's like, well, or going back to that active knowledge share, active knowledge sharing, if you know that you can be like, I'm going to tag so-and-so in this note because this discussion point came up and we recognize that, oh, you know what? This is probably a topic we should, we should talk to Darren about. So let's just tag yeah. Darren. So he knows he came up in this meeting on this topic and he can quickly find it and go, oh, okay. Team's talking about this. Yeah. Let me weigh in on this. I may not even have to join the meeting. I may be able to add sub notes going, Here's my, you know, here's my perspective on how you might want to proceed on this, or I'm going to set up time with you individually and go, Hey, you want the details go here, but can we talk for five minutes about what that was? Yep. Yep. hundred percent. Exactly. That, that's right. And that's the active, the active sharing piece. So these are all like good collaboration tactics that I could have told you about five years ago. We're just building software to make it that much easier, but they're not, none of it's revolutionary. And that's the whole thing here, right? It's not. Um, we, there's just a commitment to, to improve the way organization, your organization meets and the benefits, you know, obviously outweigh the cost tremendously. Okay. Well, and, and I think one of the things I'm, I am curious on this one because I, I'm curious how you're seeing this now that things are kind of sort of starting to open back up. And I, and I say that kind of sort of, cause it feels like one day you hear that. And then the next day it's like, well, we're back on lockdown and everything's <laughs> shut down. <laughs> But, but as things open up, there is almost this, and I almost feel like it's, it's more of this nostalgia 
than anything where, where as things are opening up, people go, Oh man, I can't wait to get back, get back in the office yeah. and, and be in person in a meeting again. And I kind of look at it and go, what? Like you, yeah. you didn't find value in these before. And now suddenly yeah, you're well, pining yeah. for it. I am curious, how are you yep. seeing organizations adapt to this? Because going back to the fact that we're probably going to be in a world where not everybody's ever going to be in the same room at the same time. Yep. I mean, it's going to be more of a rarity than it was, but it used to be like, well, you probably had a good chance at that. Now it's like some percentage of people are always going to be there. How do you see yep. that shifting yep. and how do you see this helping solve that? Got lots of views there. Um, so uh, we now, you know, we now think about work as hybrid rather than remote or okay. in the office or work from home or the office and those sorts of things. Um, and Look, at a personal level, it's it's funny because um, I've never been happy. I've never been more productive than the last two years. I, um, you know, I've 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 been home every night uh, for dinner time and seeing my you know young children. Whereas my first, you know, which she was born twenty eighteen, um, I never saw her. Right, I get home, she's already in bed. You leave before she's awake. Um, my my whole family life is is different. Um, I'm not spending an hour a day commuting, and that's not even that long. An hour a day for most Americans, they're spending more more than that, you know, in the car oh. or on the train or the bus or whatever. Um, so all of these things, I've I've never been happier. So this drive to go, well, hang on, pandemic's over. Now's the time to get back to work is bizarre for me. I'm like, oh, back exactly what you said. Back to old ways of working where I wasted my time and never saw my kids. <laughs> like, why? Um, so that's one. <laughs> Um, and, by, and by the way, to the extent um, to the extent that the workforce feel the same way, and many of them do because they've left the big cities, they've moved away, they've changed their life, they're yeah. you know living a higher quality of life because they're not spending crazy money on big city rent, whatever it is. Um, they they walk they're, they're they're voting with their feet. If 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 I, you know how often I'll be interviewing someone for a role lately as a remote company, I'm like, why are you leaving? And they're like, up oh, organization, our company is making us go back to the office. Um, yeah. So, so it's not up to business anymore. If you want good talent, your talent pool is is, is completely um, limited. If you're if you're not you're not going to agree with that, but to your point, I think what's happening is the pendulum just swings. You know, like we we've gone from every day in the office, many businesses to no human contact, and it's natural to want some human contact. And the ideal yeah. isn't that. What we do completely remote. Every quarter, we get together for a week. Um, we hang out, we spend time, we plan for the quarter, we, we socialize, we build relationships. That helps us when we're apart, understand each other and be more productive. And that's what we need as a business, you know, for our team to have that connection. So we don't feel like, oh my God, I haven't spoken to another adult in, in person in six months. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it, it's that pendulum that swings. I think a lot of it in this post-pandemic era, it's people like, man, I just want to travel. I just want to see people. I just want to go back to the office. I just want to do um, and that's what that's about. And that's why I think the smart organizations are talking about like hybrid strategy. At the same time, everyone's different. Um, one of the other things we've seen very, be very effective is like giving an allowance to work in a co-working space near home. You know, those days where you're like, I just need to get out of the house or I just want to talk to other people. Um, it works for me to be remote, but I just don't want to be in my own you know, room, sitting at my, staring at my laptop on my own for, you know, five days right. a week forever. Sitting at your so kitchen I, table I think, as things are all that's over. That's right. Now. Exactly. So I think all of these things are the, the you know, the, the leftover post-pandemic uh, problems that, that an effective hybrid work strategy deals with. Um, okay. But I don't think the answer is like, yeah, we have the human contact swing back to business as usual in the office every day. Um, and there's no alternative. Because to be frank, I think you'll have trouble acqu acquiring and retaining talent. If oh, you have, I, I, that view. I, I, I don't think so. I, I know so. And again, the data, the data speaks volumes about this. Yep. You know, what's, what's interesting about this piece, and I think this is something that, that it tie, the relationship between meetings and learning, I think there's a lot of parallels, which is why I thought it was a really good topic to have on this, because really everything we've talked about, even the pants analogy, this is the same as true with learning and development. Like when we pull people together for live time, re regardless of in-person, remote, what whatever it is, it's like you're asking people to give up live time. You're asking them to give up precious moments of their time that they can't be doing other things. So if you're going to do it, it better have a purpose. 
you better it better be structured you better only be asking for as much time as you absolutely need from those people and anything of value needs to be kind of like spread around and and that's not just true of like meetings that's true of development that's true of all these things 100% but what's interesting about this too is you know that i the term hybrid that's your pivot was a trigger word for you earlier in the conversation <laughs> hybrids one for me because it still focuses on location it's still like well where are you and to me i'm like listen we just need to move to flexible where it's like it's it's actually irrelevant where you are if you happen to be there great if you don't it's not a second class experience or vice versa because i've actually seen and I actually was doing engaging with a, a group that was talking about this, where actually some companies are actually seeing the opposite of in-person bias now. They're actually seeing remote bias, where the remote crews kind of gaining momentum and, and the in-person crews wow. feeling like they're out of the loop, huh. which was the opposite. It used to be like, if you were the one yeah, who was remote, right. you were like on mute, nobody yeah, talked to you right. type of a thing. And they're seeing actually the yeah. opposite. And I think it's one of these... So how do we make a seamless experience regardless? And I think that's you know, some yeah. of the things we talked about with good meeting practices, but that Hugo is actually enabling is it really doesn't matter where you are for the meeting, whether you're present, whether you're remote, whether you're in person, it's democratizing access to the conversation, to the information, yeah. to what's happening, which allows for flexibility. Where if you miss the meeting, you don't go, oh my gosh, we've got to reschedule it. Even though there's a critical decision, it's like, well, we'll work through it. You'll miss it. You'll catch up. You'll be able to do other things. Exactly. And that's why one of the strongest trends, both in L&D and meetings, um, and I've seen a lot of this in L&D, is the asynchronous stuff. So, you know, yes. gone are the days where the way to deliver effective training um, and, and help with the, the personal development of your workforce is scheduling training sessions and time and and you know you've got to be there for the hour otherwise you get no value um video and delivering that asynchronously is one of the best tools that we have at our fingertips now it works in my schedule if i want to you know clock off at 5 30 for dinner with the kids and then you know run that session at 9 p.m by watching it on my, on my laptop in bed like great that that works for me and i can consume it probably a lot better than i can if, rather than being half distracted because you scheduled it at you know 5 p.m your time um, so yeah. I, I think async is the secret here. Um, again, it also supports time zones as well as lifestyles. Um, yeah. And we've seen the quality of work has gone through the roof, even on the same time zones. Like, you know, we used to have 9 a.m. meetings. Now, our, a lot of our engineering team, they don't do that. They, they're up all night. They, that's just how they work. They, you know, their, most, their best, most effective hours are 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. or whatever. But we're saying, yeah. well, 9 a.m. is a pretty reasonable start time. We need to meet then. Um, now, with the move to well, async and working in that way, we can do that, um, even without factoring in time zones and things like that. So it's, I, I think that's part of the secret here in this you know, flexible way of working, um, changing the medium. It's not, it's not just about real-time delivery of content, real-time meetings. Um, it's having that knowledge available to you on a time schedule that suits. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, the, the flexibility of asynchronous, it's, and, and I think it'd be easy for people to, to hear the conversation and go, oh, so we're saying meetings are bad. And it's like, no, actually they're not at all. In fact, they play a critical role, but I liked your point about the three D's. It's like, that is when you say, this is when we need to bring people together live. Like we need to do it around these things with purpose. Outside of that information sharing, let's just recognize pulling people together live is a super inefficient way to deliver information. It's just, it's with technology, it is a super inefficient way. You can, like you said, we can record a video. People can play it back at 2x speed and read the transcript and skip to the parts that they want to go to anyway, or look in Hugo at the meeting notes and see, oh, you know what? 80% of this meeting, I have nothing to do with that bullet point. I'm really curious. And Darren's the one that shared it. So I'm going to ping him afterwards and say, Hey, is there anything that relates to me? And they go, no, there wasn't. Okay, great. I just saved myself an hour. Yeah, exactly. That's it. That is exactly it. Well, I, I got to say, I mean, again, this whole, this whole shift, I've, I've personally always been extremely disciplined in this because I'm, I'm an efficiency geek like you. So for me, it's like, if this isn't adding value to my day, I have yep. six kids. 
I have a job. I've got other things to do. I don't have time to spend it doing things that are non-value add. And I think you know, that was one of the things that as I got to know you and your product more, I was like, this is, this is adding efficiency to something that you have to have it. Yes, you absolutely need to have meetings to run an effective company. Can't get away from it. But can you do it significantly better than we have in the past? I think that's that's where there's been opportunity. And I think it's interesting that it took 2016, you know, before people really said, man, like, why don't we completely <laughs> rethink meetings? That's right. That's right. And and the benefit isn't just the efficiency. You know, that's how we started. We're all about ROI and yeah. measuring this stuff. And um, for sure, like in me, I can make a business case to any decision maker on why they need to think about meetings this way. But what you can't measure, and but both the cost and the reward, is the cultural impact. The way your team yeah. feels about work, uh, the, the, the feeling at the end of the day where you're like, man, I spent eight hours in meetings and got nothing done versus that was the most productive week ever. I, you know, I love working with my team in this way. Um, everyone shares information. I know what's happening. I feel connected. All of these, these softer sort of attributes um, are, have measurable value and all of them come from a much better meeting culture. Um, so well, the, 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 the data's there. <laughs> you know, what's interesting about this is in the HR and actually really at, at the C-suite in general, employee experience is one of the top conversation points. How do we improve employee experience? This and this and this. And what a lot of times isn't part of that discussion is, well, what are the things that suck at work? We, yeah, we kind of like right. avoid that. We're like, well, what if we had Not bagels? Or what if we <laughs> offer this? You know, yeah. and it's like, right, but yeah. what make what sucks? And a lot of times yeah, it's like that's right. meetings suck. So if you can make meetings not suck, every time. Yep. you can dramatically improve the employee experience. You can have people going home refreshed, feeling like they aren't right. left out of like you can actually impact employee experience through this kind of stuff, which going back to that, this isn't about just like, oh. You know, can we cut the bottom line? Can we, you know, that? I mean, that's important, but I think you can also do something bigger. 100%. Well said. Well, we could have probably had a whole cut because that I'm not even going to because that'll open a whole nother can of worms on employee experience. But I think it is a good way to connect this to this isn't just about making meetings better for the sake of making meetings better. Uh, there's, there's a lot more to it. So I appreciate you making the time. I'm glad we were able to have this conversation. Again, I, I think you guys have done a really great job with the product. If you're not familiar with Hugo folks, ch check it out. And at least you'll see some of these things that we're talking about come to life. So with that, yeah. that is another learning tech talks. I don't know. I don't have a catchy saying at the end. So thank you, Darren, for being here and uh, <laughs> really appreciate stuff. the time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise, such a great conversation, important topic. Thanks for having me. All right, have a good one, everybody.